The thing about me is that I myself am a bit of a big fan of the Scott Pilgrim franchise. I've lost count how many times I've read the comic and have watched the ever-living crap out of Edgar Wright's movie. And, honestly, I've played some of the games from time to time. So, with that little info dump dropped, let's talk about one of the more polarizing shows to come out last year. Before we jump into the show, let's get into a little bit of a background. Now, the Scott Pilgrim franchise pretty much begins at the graphic novel, Scott Pilgrim's Precious Little Light, written by Canadian writer Brian Lee O'Malley. It follows none other than the title character, 23-year-old Scott Pilgrim, as he is a guitar player while also dating 17-year-old Knives Chow, which at the beginning is actually caused a bit of a stir within the band, and they do call him out for it. And the comic does actually look into the relationship between the two of them for a time and actually points out that what Scott is actually doing is not exactly all that great, but continuing. One day he goes to a party and sees Ramona Flowers, someone who has been appearing in his dreams. The reason being is that she is a delivery person and uses his dreams as a shortcut. Just roll with it. Despite several other people's protests for him not to go out with her, he asks her out, despite not really telling knives and somewhat being a jerk not really listening to anybody. During a concert that his band is attending to, things are interrupted when one of Ramona's exes crashes the party, challenging Scott to a fight for Ramona's hand to date. After which, the main premise of the story shows itself. Scott is to face off against Ramona's seven evil exes while also navigating the fact that he is technically two-timing two different people as well as facing up his past dating mistakes. The comic itself could get its own video but it's still a fun read. It's clearly more than apparent that Brian took a lot of inspiration from many shonen anime and manga as well as several video games, hence the very video game-esque premise. And honestly, right here now, I'll say it's a top tier comic. It's in my personal top 10. Go and read it if you're interested. As for the movie that came out in 2010, it follows a very similar storyline, but the last act is very different than the comics. But it still follows the tone, style, and insanity that is more so elevated by two major factors. One being the fact that it's in live action, and two being that Edgar Wright was at the helm of directing, whose chaotic and stylized way of filming and editing actually fits the style of the comic. Sadly though, the movie did not do too well financially. The movie was a bit of a hard sell, and the comic at the time was not that well known. It was rather niche. But cut to years later, the movie has gained a bit of a cult following, and memes aside... has pretty much earned it, but cut, cut to present day-ish, after several games, a rise in popularity in both the comic and movie, Scott Pilgrim takes off an animated, seemingly adaptation of the comic that has the exact art style and tone, produced by Edgar Wright and written by Brian Lee O'Malley, as well as the cast from the movie all coming back reprising their roles. So, you can imagine everyone's reaction to the news that, well, it was not exactly an adaptation of Brian's comic. In actuality, Scott Pilgrim Takes Off is a semi-sequel that has Ramona be the main lead as she tries to figure out how Scott was beaten in the, in the very first episode. What follows is a very different storyline as opposed to the one shown in a comic and the film. And the reason I say semi-sequel is, well, slight spoilers, Scott was actually teleported by a time travel portal sent by future Scott. 
who actually hated how his relationship with Ramona turned out. They are taking a break, he actually overreacted. Biblical Scott. So he screwed with the timeline in order to ensure that he never got into a relationship with Mona to begin with. You know, small differences. And it's hard to ignore the fact that only a few days before the series dropped, it was announced that the show was going to have a massive bait and switch at the start, and already, nowadays, that spells disaster. Case in point, Netflix's Cowboy Bebop, Amazon Rings of Power, and many others. So, I honestly don't blame anybody for feeling the way they did, and in all honesty, the backlash when the show first dropped was somewhat warranted since we have seen this song and dance so many times it's clear it just does not click with companies that no one likes these changes. Granted, there are exceptions to the rule, in my opinion this series is one of them, but the point still stands. Maybe things could have been different if the series changes were upfront and known day one, that Brian and Edgar were honest and advertised the series as a new version of the story you know, or you know the Scott Pilgrim story, you've read the comic, you've watched the film, witness a brand new version of the story told in a way you never expected or something like that, and market it as a semi-sequel to the movie and comic, or more so the comic since the show mentions details only the comic actually has and mentions and not a film at all. So yeah, as opposed to an adaptation, go watch the first trailer and notice how only shows moments that are close to the actual comic and nothing is mentioned about Scott's disappearance, Ramona being being the main character, or any of the scenes that show the exes interacting with each other. It's honest to God staggering to think that they thought that this deceptive marketing was okay in any way and won't lead to any backlash. But with that said, how do I feel about Scott Pilgrim Takes Off? I... I like it. What? What the fuck? Now, before you all kill me, I want to get some things straight. That does not mean this series is flawless or that that is not warranted of criticism. And I will get to them in a bit, but... First, let's get into what I think worked in the series' favor. The animation. The animation is honestly on point and the action in the show is legit amazing. Obviously made better by the fact that it uses the comics art style, making the show feel like it, it is in fact an animated version of Brian's graphic novel. And despite the changes and obvious switch-ups, takes off honestly does feel like it's still in the spirit of the comic, and that is mostly due to the fact that Brian is indeed still attached, he is in fact in the writer's room and had a hand in the creation of the series, so in a way, it's a fitting continuation of the comic that came out so many years ago. Characters act and play out how you expect they would if they were tossed in the situation they were at the very start. Nobody really acts out of character, and as much as I hate to say, the fact that this is not a one-to-one -one of the comic made it open for characters like the exes to be fleshed out even further. They interact with each other some more, and one of my favorite scenes in the show was seeing Lucas Lee and Gideon play video games and watch anime. Another highlight is the fight between Ramona and Roxy, which delves deeper and kind of brings up something that was honestly glanced at if you've only read the comic or watched the film, and that is Ramona's kind of a bitch. Sorry. I don't want to fight you, Roxy. I'm gonna run away like you did back then. <sighs> <sighs> Roxy, I...
in many cases, she's no better than Scott in that she would often leave her exes out to dry or like in Roxy's case, abandon them when they actually needed them the most, leaving them scarred. As cringe and article-like as this sound, takes off does in fact do a good job in humanizing the exes and showing a side of them I honestly never thought I would want to see. It was a good breath of fresh air and showed that Brian was still capable of writing something that is truly on point. However, that does not mean there aren't issues. One major, major plot hole in the entire show stems from the inciting incident, Scott's death, quote unquote. Now, if you have read the comic, you would know that once someone loses a fight, they don't in fact die. They in fact respawn back at their house or home or wherever they're staying. So, why was there a funeral set for Scott? Wouldn't he just respawn back at Wallace's place? It does not help that when other characters get changed, it gets mentioned that they get respawned at their place of residence, so yeah, small things like that can take you out of it. Not only that, but characters who had a good development in the comic that actually did not get a chance to really shine in the movie, sadly, didn't get their moment here either. Some are just relegated to just background characters, and yes, I'm in fact talking about Steven. It's not perfect at all by any means, but the final fight is one that ultimately fits the tone and spirit of not only the show but the comic as well. It's freaking awesome. The ending is also one that fits and does show it's not a Ramona and Scott should never be together type of thing that many thought it was gonna be. Spoilers, they get back together, plus there is a mid credit scene where it hints that there is more to come. Whether or not there is more is honestly up in the air at this moment because of, well, obvious reasons, but we'll see. One other point to mention is the voice acting. Now, it's very hit or miss. The Japanese dub is honestly as good as you expect. People doing the roles actually do a good job. As for the film cast, um, uh, yeah, it's rather, like I said, hit or miss. Some are doing a good job, actually, and bring the same level of energy that they did in the original film. Case in point, Chris Evans as Lucas Lee is just as fun as he was in the film. Er, actually, oddly enough, doing a better job. Michael Sarah as Scott, and by the record, actually kind of, in a weird way, closer to his comic book counterpart than he was a, in the film. That's mostly down to possibly performance or writing, I don't really know. But one thing, and this is a bit of a tangent, yes, but film Scott and comic Scott are dicks in different ways. Yes, they're jerks for not letting Knives be aware that they're dating Ramona, but Film Scott, because he's played by Michael Cera, he brings his, well, awkward demeanor to the role, and through that, Scott rather kinda knows that what he's doing is messed up, but he doesn't want to address it, while comic Scott is a lot more upfront and a bit of an dick about it and clearly doesn't give a shit. Here in the show, he's much closer to his comic book counterpart, which is kind of funny because he's played by the same actor who played him in the film. Not really a lot has actually changed in the last couple years. I honestly haven't seen that much of Michael Cera's recent work, but I will say it was kind of fun seeing the same actor play him oddly closer to how I expected him to act in the comic. But moving on, there are other voice actors still that are honestly bad at what they're doing, case in point, one of which the main character, Ramona Flowers herself, Mary Elizabeth Weinstead, she's a good actress. So this is honestly kind of a shock to me to say the fact that, well, he's not really that great in this show, at least. Sonic guy? Yes, that's me. Are you Wallace Wells? No, I'm Scott, Scott Pilgrim. Wallace is my cool gay roommate. He lets me use his credit card. Oh, so like a sugar daddy situation. Not quite 8 a.m. I have to work, so you have to leave. What's up, Ramona? Nothing major. Just somebody kidnapped Scott Pilgrim and faked his death. She mostly comes across very bored and tired. Before anyone says anything, no, she is not like that in the movie either. Mm. It was just a phase. Just a phase? You had a sexy face? It meant nothing. I didn't think it would count. It meant nothing? I was just a little bi-curious. 
Well, then Gideon best get his pretentious ass up here because I'm about to kick yours out of the great white north. Either her direction was poor or that this is what they wanted. Either case, doesn't matter. And she is honestly one of the weaker parts of the show. And it does not help that he's actually the focus character. So, yeah, that is a damn shame. Fingers crossed, however, for season two if it comes out. And hopefully she stepped things up and once given the chance. Overall, I thoroughly enjoyed Scott Pilgrim Takes Off, but I would be lying to you if I said that I did not have my hookups with it. The show is not total garbage, nor a flawless masterpiece. It has its highs, and it has its lows. But overall, I will be lying to you if I said I didn't have fun. It, it was enjoyable. Granted, like, yeah, it sucks that it's not an adaptation, but I still found enjoyment in it. And with that said, it's kind of a hard sell for me. It's not a total recommendation. If you yourself have any hookups with this series by the premise or by what I said, I don't blame you. And it's completely up to you whether or not you actually want to be invested at all. But it's clear that the overall deceptive marketing left a god-awful taste in everyone's mouth. So those who could have liked the show would more than likely never give it a shot because of that. Here's a good opportunity to use a clip from Otaku Daikun, who actually put it best. Perhaps it's not the fans who are bored, but the creators. Perhaps they aren't as thrilled about the prospect of a remake as we are. Maybe they felt like their original creation was flawless and not in need of an update. Maybe they're just sick of telling the same story. Thus, if fans ask a creator to revisit their own work, they're going to use it as an opportunity to innovate rather than give fans what they truly want. I can sympathize with this to an extent. Whenever I make videos that aren't about the Fate series, for instance, they typically don't get as many views. What I want to create isn't necessarily what viewers want me to create. That's just how things roll. Sometimes creators change modern adaptations so that they don't invalidate the original work. For example, Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition is aptly named because it more or less replaces the Wii version. With the game's better graphics, quality of life adjustments, and extra content, there's really no reason to go back to the Wii for what is arguably an inferior experience. It's possible that Brian Lee didn't want the new Scott Pilgrim anime to compete with his comics. With movement and sound, the anime could easily depict the comic's story, but do it even better and with more detail. By making its story new, however, fans still have a reason to experience both the comic and anime for their own merits. Sadly, this is often accompanied by the criticism that if you don't like the new version, you can always just go back to the old, which for many invalidates the whole point of a remake altogether. Still, in this case, it shows the creator very much cares about what they created back then. By preserving the relevance of the original, they endorse its quality. Other creators, however, revisit their old works to try and fix them. I call this the George Lucas effect. With advancements in CGI technology, Lucas went back to the original Star Wars trilogy and updated it with a number of changes. It's even worse when new creators step into a project they didn't originally create. They make changes not just to things they don't approve of, but also to leave their own mark on the franchise, similar to how certain localizers change scripts to inflate their own egos. My most frustrating example is Netflix's live-action Cowboy Bebop, which was clearly made by people with contempt for the original. The new creators took issue with Gren's original depiction, and instead reimagined his character as non-binary. Similarly, we have Daniela Pineda, who worked with designers to alter Faye's iconic outfit, taking issue with the original for being too sexualized. Back in the day, we didn't think to ask for authentic remakes, because we didn't realize just how unfaithful they could become. Now, however, the discussion is far more relevant, and I think Scott Pilgrim's anime is an interesting addition to that discussion. And on that sour as hell note, I'm wrapping this up. Let me know your thoughts on the video as well as the show down in the comments. Honestly, I legit would like to hear other people's thoughts thoroughly. There's a lot to say about this show, and hopefully through time, maybe things look more unfortunate with the show, but call out the marketing because it is hands down the weakest and worst part of the show by far. No contest. So, yeah. But on that note, get your like, comment, sub, all that good jazz. Take care, guys. Stay chill, Wanderers. 
What's that? You're outside? <laughs> this guy here? Uh, you know what? He just left. <laughs>